So yeah, our final talk of the day is uh, by my next door uh, office neighbor, Los Alamos, uh, Ivan Vita, scientist for the Park Theory Group. And Ivan is responsible for several foundational uh, discoveries and advances in the theory of and so he is the man to tell us about TMD physics and dense matters. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. So again, I want to make sure that you guys can hear me that okay. All right. So I was asked to talk about TMD physics and dense matter. And let's go do this. Uh, here is a brief outline of the lecture. Uh, I, I should tell you that. You know, kind of a clear understanding of TMDs in balanced matter does not exist. And I'll uh, try to explain which is uh, the closest to which we can get going from uh, reactions with nucleons to reactions with nuclei, or maybe even more uh, complicated systems such as the quadrant plasma. So I'll talk about this first to motivate the approach. <clears throat> then I'll talk briefly about uh, scattering in balanced matter. You already heard quite a bit from Yuri uh, when scattering happens in the small X regime, and it's described as dipole scattering, but this doesn't have to be the case. In fact, uh, most of the TMD physics that we know happens at large values of the RK max. Then I'll go and talk about radiation in dense matter, because you will see that the effects of scattering are relatively small, especially when we go to higher energy. Now, I'll show you examples of a few observables where dense matter modifies the structure of jets, the distribution of hadrons, and I'll come to the conclusions. Uh, this is a, a fair bit more expanded relative to what you find in the uh, handbook, where uh, just some of the basic ideas, especially about radiation, are outlined. <clears throat> so, first, when we talk about dense matter, what do we mean? Now, there are different types of dense matter. There's cold nuclear matter, such as the electron ion collider, when we have electron nucleus collisions, or proton nucleus collisions at fixed target experiments, first Fermilab, but also at Rick and LHC. And we also can have hot dense matter, such as the quartum plasma, which is believed to have existed about a microsecond after the Big Bang. And in fact, it's also recreated today in relativistic heavy ion collisions at RIC and LHC. And even uh, it seems the broader public is aware of its existence, can be studied with a microscope. So what is uh, kind of the first insight that we have gotten from reactions with nuclei on transverse momentum physics? And that was the discovery of transverse momentum broadening of hadrons at small to intermediate transverse momentum on the order of few GV. The measurement was first done in 1975 by Jim Cronin. Those are fixed target experiments, Fermilab. And what you will see, the way in which the ratio of the cross section was represented relative to the expected A scaling, when we have a proton nucleus collision, of course, we expect the cross section to be eight times larger. The question is whether there are significant deviations from this near a scaling. Is it simply a flat line at one, or is there a structure relative to it? And to see that there is a structure, there is an enhancement from multiple scattering from soft physics and the media transverse momentum. Sorry, the expectation is that RPA is going to be proportional to A, right? Yeah. So if out, if it, if it's proportional to A, then alpha should be two. Or is there a type of alpha? Should that be alpha plus one? Or? Uh, no, RPA is the translation from the, those are different representations. Uh, okay. This is how uh, Jim Crowning represented it, right? And oh, so if we okay, have A, right, if it's exactly. one, it would be the exact scaling. Okay. But no one uses this representation today. So they actually construct the ratio of what the cross section would have been divided by your expectation. And then it's much easier and clearer to see the magnitude of the effect. Okay. And this is the translation formula. I did many years ago, I hope it's correct. 
But, okay, uh, I see. So, so it's alpha minus one there because what you're saying is RPA is the actual cross section yeah. of the H on the system. Yeah, exactly. I'll be watching this back. And so this is this manifestation of soft physics. Uh, but you see that it's uh, in some sense not universal. Uh, what is shown is the ratio of the cross section on a large nucleus, like a tungsten over a small nucleus, such as beryllium. And uh, there is still an enhancement. In other words, those effects are bigger for larger nuclei. They depend on the nucleus. They also depend on the energy. They're larger at smaller center of mass energies and smaller at larger energies. And finally, if you actually think differentially about what the physics is, you know, the effects will be larger in central collisions when we have central proton nucleus collision, the proton goes through the middle, that was a question that was asked earlier, then to the periphery of the collision. So, so can we do about this? Sorry? What is the, the beam energy for the last one? Uh, the beam energies, that's, that, that was a fixed target experiment. I have given you here some, okay, it was not included. The center of mass energies go from uh, about 20 something to 38.8 GeV, but it was not a collider experiment, it was a fixed target experiment. So the proton beam varied from 200 to 400 GeV, uh, sorry, to 800 GeV. And 800 GeV gave about root acid. So those were the energies. We, of course, now have much larger energies at the relativistic heavy ion collider and even larger at uh, the large heavy ion collider. So <clears throat> what is illustrated here is that also we have this dependence on the impact parameter of centrality. Now, kind of when the collision is head on, we call it central. When the collision is uh, just grazing the collision, we call it peripheral collision. And uh, even when we do a proton nucleus or a trick, we do deuterium nucleus collisions, we can see that going from the central ones, when we go through the center to the more peripheral ones, there is a clear centrality dependence on this physics. So it's in this sense, it's quite process dependent. And so what can we do? We can perhaps start with a TMD, which has an X and KT dependence, and now make it four dimensional. We have an extra dimension for the nucleus, and we have an extra dimension for the centrality, and that would become super complicated. So that's perhaps not the most economical way. A more economical way is to try to represent all of those interactions, which in fact generate the TMD physics in dense matter into unit parameters, properties, universal properties of nuclear matter, such as the transport, co uh, transport coefficient, which is a transverse momentum transfer per scattering divided by the scattering length. And in fact, even if you try to express the whole process of, scat of scatterings in terms of uh, wheels and lines here, you can do this by dividing by the size of the nucleus, as was shown in this paper. So this is the, the approach that I'm going to take. And by fitting perhaps one parameter, constraining it from data, we can eliminate two of the dimensions in this fit, make the problem much, much simpler. So let's see how we can do this, uh, starting with the physical picture. How do I do this? Try to slide. Yeah. Slide, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to do this in a physical picture of scattering, which we can formulate in a gauge invariant fashion. The way in which we are going to do this is following uh, the effective field theory approach. And we already heard from Duff and also from Tom about EFTs. This is the basic idea of the EFTs to integrate our degrees of freedom. Uh, above a certain scale. And here are examples of successful EFTs in, uh, that, that we have in the theory of strong interactions. We didn't talk much about chiral perturbation theory and heavy quark effective theory, but we heard a lot about soft collinear effective theory and also non-relativistic QCD. And those are the theories that can also be generated 
to describe this interaction physics inside dense matter. And I'll show you, at least schematically, how this can be done. So examples of those theories generalized interactions, as I said, are SCT and soft collinear effective theory. And this has allowed us to go beyond a, a very vast body of work, which was simply interested in radiative energy loss of those color charges as they propagate to the nucleus. The formulation of those theories, however, allowed us to more clearly formulate uh, corrections to the factorization theorems, for example, in SCP, calculate corrections to the jet and beam functions, and also go beyond the energy loss approach. It allows us to bridge the gap essentially between heavy ion phenomenology and high energy physics and do things more rigorously. Now, <clears throat> what is missing? Let's say, let's take SCP, for example. Uh, we have the Beam, uh, sorry, the beam functions, the jet functions. We can also have soft radiation, which is not directional, but isotropic. But what's really missing is the interactions between those beams and jets and the constituents of the dense medium. And as I'm going to show in a moment, those interactions are preferentially in the direction perpendicular to the collinear directions. And they're mediated by gluons. You already heard from Yuri that you know, gluon scattering is a very effective way. It gives the largest cross sections, largest enhancement, and it's preferentially in the transverse direction. So let's see if we can see this explicitly. Uh, kind of for fun, uh, with regard to Vanessa, we did a calculation of an energetic parton scattering on another parton from the medium that can have a variety of masses from, you know, something that we can think about its divine mass in the quark-gluon plasma or a nucleon mass, all the way to essentially being infinitely heavy. And you know that when we calculate Feynman diagrams, we have certain Mandelstam variables and they have a specific meaning. The T channel, in fact, corresponds to forward scattering, and that would be the jet broadening and energy loss. Now, S channel scattering will be isotropization. It's kind of fairly isotropic, and two channel will be backward scattering. So, if we're going to talk, we're going to talk about very energetic patterns propagating through matter, that would be the T channel. And if you do a calculation, a full calculation, which I've illustrated here, it has combinations from the actual matrix element and the phase space. But if we can combine those together, and they're different depending on the mass. But if we can combine those together, in all cases, we see that the scattering cross section is very strongly peaked in the forward direction. And this corresponds to this T channel exchange where the global gluon is perpendicular to the direction of the propagation. So, this is why in 2008, Ahmad and Dubian collaborators took the first step in generalizing SCT to include interactions with matter, and they considered this term, which is the scattering of the energetic quark with the Glauber bloom field. And several years later, Gregorio Vanessian and collaborators included the gauge sector, the interaction between the gluons and uh, the Glauber bloom, which mediates the interaction. And this completed this Lagrangian from which we can now calculate processes in dense matter. Now, what are the Feynman rules uh, <clears throat> for the different components? What are the momentum scalings? What are the scalings of the fields? Depends on the gauge, and it also depends on the type of source in the medium, the quasi particles in the medium that make the global gluon. And they're just given for reference. Of course, I don't expect anyone uh, to, to remember them, but they can be derived. The point is that from the scalings, that Duff Neil talked about, we can derive those final rules. Because the global gluon, and it was also mentioned, is an offshell mode. It's simply a mediator of the interaction. It's not a final state observable particle. Then it can be modeled by a potential. And that's the approach that it will be, and also we will regard it with Messian too. But we can take a step further and, in fact, see roughly what form 
this Glauber potential or this Glauber field will have. This was first done by Ira Rothstein and Ian Stewart, who were considering not dense but dilute systems. For example, do you have factorization violation in Galian production or deep elastic scattering from Glauber gluons? And they were treating not only the energetic parton, but also the second parton, let's say from the second parton as an active parton, you have to do that. And they were able to write down expressions for the Glauber fields. And you see that depending on the source, when you have an energetic part on down here, you have this Glauber gluon exchange and you really indeed recover the transverse momentum dependence. In principle, your medium, or, you know, the second part or can be soft. It can be not linear, in which case the momentum exchange is much more isotropic. You see that it's in three directions, three dimensional. But for simplicity, we'll stick in this case. I'll also like to point out that, of course, when we go to the case of dense medium, there is a lot of non perturbative physics. This would be a bad propagator from the global exchange. But in dense matter, we have loop effects. They, they can be hard thermal loop effects, they can be dense matter effects. And uh, those Q squares acquire something that you can think of as a Debye mass or the inverse range of the interactions. Unlike in QED, in QCD, our interactions are finite range. And what stands here is the inverse range of the interaction and the type of potential then becomes from Coulomb, it becomes Yukawa potential. And that's what we'll be using in the modeling of those interactions. Now, <clears throat> Let's start with uh, the idea of jet problem. And the basic idea is to try to express things in gauge invariant objects, for example, scattering on individual nucleons or quasi particles in terms of cross sections, scattering lengths, which are gauge invariant. In order to do that, we have to realize that we need two balloon exchanges in the cross section to build one power of the elastic scattering cross section. And we can do this two ways. We can take a single scattering in the amplitude and then square it, and then we get two. Or we can have no interaction in the amplitude and two interactions, but they have to be in the same point in the complex conjugate. We call this term single barn Glauber gluon exchange. And this we call double barn Glauber gluon exchange. And if you think about it, it will correspond to all possible equal infinity cuts that we can take to a diagram like that. Why do we need two Glauber gluon exchanges to build one power? What does it even mean? Um, well, imagine that you have a part on here, right? So, so your lowest order cross section is, you know, a part on, one part on, two part ons, and one exchange between them. When you square it, you kind of you have two of those propagators. That's what I mean. No, right. It's just simple. But you can do this by having nothing in the amplitude, actually two in the complex conjugate amplitude or vice versa. And this is very important because it conserves unitarity. So <clears throat> let's start. Uh, you know, of course, we can have uh, nothing happened to our original jet. And the reason for which I've not taken simply an asymptotic state is because more often than not, our partons are offshell. And the idea of this source J of P is that it can model offshell, offshell partons that they can propagate and radiate inside the medium. And we can write an expression for this amplitude and we can put all of the energy dependence that we want inside this source J of P. This is just kind of the asymptotic state here. And the other important thing that we have to notice when we talk about matter is that we have to keep track of the position of interactions or production of jets and represent them like plane waves. This phase here is essentially a plane wave that tells us that a jet of momentum P was produced at this point because later on we'll see that it will interact at some other point and we might need to keep track of those phases especially for radiation because this is the key of one famous effect known as the landau mirage effect 
its destructive interference effect, which I'll come a little bit later. And of course, we can calculate the cross section to produce our jet. And for simplicity, you know, we can adjust this simply to be one jet, not five, not 10, with a unit energy and no transverse momentum. We can do any modeling that we want. Now let's go to calculate what happens when we propagate in the medium. And we have to tackle those two diagrams. Well, we have to integrate over all the momentum exchanges of those louder gluons. And this is what is illustrated here. It's a four dimensional integral, but uh, one of the components of this potential which models the global law is zero. And what this means is that on the time scale of the scattering, it's time independent or light cone time independent. So nothing changes on the scale of the scattering. So it has happened sufficiently fast so that it doesn't know, for example, the jet doesn't know that maybe the density of the medium changed or this particle recoiled a little bit. Then there is another longitudinal integral to make, and let's first do the negative, the Q minus integral. When we look at those diagrams, what we'll see is that propagators, and there are also you know, some algebra in the numerator. The numerator is fairly simple. So uh, the global one vertex and the propagator will bring terms like n slash and n bar slash, and you know, with a factor of two down, this is essentially unity. So the numerator algebra is fairly trivial after we pull out the large light cone momentum, and we are left to deal with the propagators. From the propagators, again, I've pulled out the large light cone momentum P plus, and that's what we are left with. And what we are instructed to do is to take those integrals, which ends up being done by contour integration. So if you've not done that, that's you know, a useful exercise. You identify the poles in the propagators. And because we are looking at pos positive physical distances from the production of the jet to the global gluon scattering, this distance delta Z is positive. We can figure out from the sign of I epsilon which direction to close the contour. And then we take the residue of the function at the pole and we can write our expressions. So the first diagram is fairly trivial because of this exponent. The second diagram is a little tricky because we have two of those propagators and only one phase, but it still can be done. And these are the corresponding results. Now, for the sake of completeness, I've kept those phases here for the purpose of elastic scattering without radiation. I don't need to do that because all of those numbers are very, very small. They're suppressed by the large jet energy. And eventually they will disappear. Whether I set them, I set those to zero right away, and then the, the exponents are one, or later when I average over the transverse positions of the jet. So the next thing that I have to realize is that there isn't only one scattering in the medium, but there are multiple scatterings. And so let's assume that there's n of them, and I can average over their transverse position, perpendicular to the direction of jet propagation. And so here is what's going to happen. When we have this diagram square, we have one global one exchange in the amplitude and one global exchange in the conjugate amplitude. And when I perform this integration, it will give me a delta function, which will make the two momenta equal. On the other hand, if I have a diagram like that, and remember, I have to take the limit when those two positions are identical, then I'll have an exponent of the sum of those momenta, and then the delta function will set the sum to zero. And so see what happened. The first diagram will actually correspond to a physical scattering, physical momentum transfer, and actually deflection of a jet. But the second diagram will have no net momentum transfer. The jet will continue in the forward direction. And so it will build one power of the scattering cross section just without net transverse momentum. It will also come with an opposite sign. 
And those are those unitary interactions which preserve the number of jets. So this is the final expression. So the result of calculating those diagrams is that our jet, which you know, without any interaction is one, is uh, modified then by this distribution. The first part tells us that we have to average over the transverse moment of the global gluon. And this from quantum mechanics, you remember that's a shift operator. It will shift the distribution of what originally was there. Whereas the second term is the total cross section with no negative shift. And we, if we integrate over the far null distribution, this will actually give a zero. So multiple scattering, when you do scattering, it changes the distribution of particles in the final state, but it does not change the number. And that's what I meant by unitary conservation. It's very important. Otherwise, you'll just be getting wrong and random numbers. Now, generalizing this, let's imagine that we don't have one scattering. We have multiple scatterings. Uh, this is what the result will be. I have converted those uh, areas and lengths into a volume, and the number over volume is the density. And if I multiply and divide by the total elastic scattering cross section, I'll get a scattering length. And then you have this normalized distribution to give some transverse momentum to the parton minus the unitary interaction. And summing over all of those, this is the final result. What you will see for the final distribution of partons given some initial distribution. There is, in fact, a very simple physical explanation. Imagine that your parton on your jet underwent chi scatterings on average, which is L over the scattering plane. The first part that you see here is simply the Poisson probability that you get exactly N scatterings if chi is the average. This is simply a Poisson distribution. And the second part tells me that if I'm interested of a jet in a jet that, let's say, ended up at 4 GeV, I have to take all possible configurations, all possible ways that I can start away from 10, from 4 GeV, or maybe even 4, and get there via multiple global gluon exchanges. So this is the master formula, which we can apply, for example, to TMD physics. Now imagine that this is your distribution, uh, TMD distribution, for example, for a quark. I mean, it doesn't have to be a delta function. We parameterize it, it's non-perturbative. Then if you give me a nucleus, and I know what the nuclear geometry is, and I can perform those integrals to find the average number of scatterings, I can tell you what the final TMD distribution will be in a large nucleus starting from a nucleon. And I need to know only very few parameters. I need to know what are the scattering lengths, and I need to know what are the typical momentum transfers, like, for example, here mu, and uh, they can be combined in a transfer coefficient. So rather than having parameterization of the whole set of nuclei, you know, the 100 nuclei and different centralities, we can calculate those TMDs starting just from what we know in the proton. There are simpler cases where, you know, if you're willing to make certain approximations, imagine that uh, you want to do a Gaussian approximation only. You can start with this normalized elastic scattering cross-section of a Yukawa type, and that would be the normalized elastic scattering cross-section. You can resume this series in impact parameter space. Fourier transforming, you will find that uh, it, had, it is a Bessel function, and expanding the Bessel function, the first term is quadratic. And then if you neglect the other terms, as well as some weakly varying logarithms, this factor psi here has this exact expression, you can Fourier transform back and you'll find a Gaussian distribution. So if you started with a parton or something that doesn't have transverse momentum, random walk will give you a Gaussian distribution, but only under this approximation. So here is the comparison. This is the full solution to this equation. And you see that it starts as a Gaussian 
but it quickly develops power law failures. And the Gaussian approximation is good only at relatively small transverse momentum. You can expand it by you know, kind of choosing a finite value for this parameter chi, but in principle, this is what you can do numerically. If you do a Gaussian approximation, this is why also TMDs are oftentimes parameterized as a Gaussian. And if you work in this limit, then it's quite easy. You can simply calculate the RMS broadening from this Gaussian and add it to the modeling of the TMD of the proton. So this is where, you know, kind of TMD physics comes um, in nuclei when it comes, uh, when it's, uh, it's a result of multiple scattering. Now, how about phenomenology? I told you that all of, you know, this, those two dimensions can reduce down to perhaps one or two parameters. And this is the transport parameter Q hat which is the typical transverse momentum broadening per unit length. And here is uh, the form that it has. Numerically, it's very small. It's actually about 0 0.05 to about one Jeff square Fermi, and that's for quarks. And gluons, of course, have larger color charges, which is encoded by the quadratic Casimir and you know, they'll have a value of you have which is 2.25 times large. And that, of course, is a three level result. So, where is this elastic scattering manifest? As I pointed out, it is manifesting the enhancement of a small transverse momentum spectra in PA collisions, such as the ones that are shown here. People have also done some phenomenology at the electron ion collider. So what they proposed is that you measure an electron, and in this case, on the order of 10 GeV, and then you measure the jet on the opposite way, on the opposite side. And you ask the question, what is the away side distribution of a jet when it, you know, we have this kind of TMD scattering in the nucleus? And here are the results. In fact, when you look at the number of parameters, the black line is the one on the proton, and the dashed lines are with different choice of this transport parameter. And you see the results are fairly small. So the bottom line is that if you want to do TMD physics, you want to be sensitive to the soft scattering in the medium, you have to look at fairly low transverse momentum. Well, uh, the question is, and you know, let me just take a second break. Start our work. Good. That was the plan. And then the question is, well, if the effects of scattering are small, I mean, are there any large effects that come from this physics? And the large effects come from the medium induced radiative corrections. So it's the radiation associated with this multiple scattering uh, that gives the dominant result. Now, let's see what can, we can do with radiation. If we think once again, of the most uh, general approach that we can take. Radiation uh, you know, kind of takes us from the hard scattering short distance process to the very long uh, distance process of catalyzation, and it's encoded in this branch form in those branching processes. So if we want to be most general, we are going to calculate the medium induced splitting functions. Those would be the analog of the alternative resistance splitting functions. And they enter higher order calculations and evolution. So we'll be able to do higher order and uh, you know, medium evolved calculations uh, in case of nuclei reactions with nuclei or the quadrant plasma. So here are the amplitudes that we have to calculate. And once again, instead of starting for the vacuum, I've put here this conspicuous J, this source, because you know that an on-shell massless parton cannot decay into two on-shell masses partons. So we have a virtuality in this process. And in our calculations, we'll be conserving the large light pole momentum. We'll be conserving the transverse momentum. So the virtuality will come in terms of the negative, the small negative light pole momentum. So here's how we can do one calculation. This is one example for example, uh, done in SVT, there is a little, a little work 
in all of those calculations that I want to talk about. It's always, of course, useful if we start in some simple coordinate system. Our initial parton doesn't have transverse momentum. Then the two parent partons will have equal and opposite. In high energy physics, we label the parent parton after it splits, it carries momentum fraction x, and the daughter parton carries momentum fraction one minus x. I've labeled them differently. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, there have been decades of calculations of soft bloom radiation. It is the soft bloom radiation in the medium, which is known as radiated energy loss. And uh, essentially to stick to this tradition, I've labeled the momentum fraction of the bloom of the daughter part onto the X, so that when X is small, kind of you make this natural connection to soft. That is exactly opposite to the high energy convention. So if some of the results you know, look a little strange, this is because of this convention. We can do the calculation, for example, taking the light pound gauge, in which case the polarization vector can be calculated to have uh, this form with two physical transverse polarizations. We can write down an expression for this diagram, and when we dot you know, the free new index, there must be a new index hanging everywhere into the polarization, that it simplifies significantly. Uh, the transverse vectors A, B, C that you will see later are certain combinations of the longitudinal momentum fraction X that the daughter takes into one minus X, and also the transverse momentum. And in this simplified kinematics, when they're equal and opposite, in fact, A, the whole A vector will reduce to be simply K per transverse momentum. When we calculate this diagram, we can see that it factorizes into a part which corresponds to the production of the jet itself, the, the somewhat offshore part on, and then the splitting function with the corresponding supplying the corresponding phase space elements. We can identify the fully differential. This is a differential both in X and K per distribution of those alternative per splitting functions for quarks which has the following shape. And uh, just for completeness, I've written them here. They can all be derived. And once again, uh, if you come from high energy physics, for you, this will read one plus X squared divided by one minus X. The difference is just X going to one minus X because of the convention that I mentioned. In addition to the continuous parts that we've calculated, the diagonal splitting functions, which is this splitting function, and that splitting function also have singular parts. They have delta function parts. And you can either calculate them through loops, but that's actually a more elegant way of doing it using momentum and flavors of rules. So this is what happens in the vacuum. What we really want to calculate is those splitting functions inside the medium. And we have to think of diagrams like that. Once again, that would be square of diagrams with a single Glauber gluon exchange, and then diagrams with two Glauber gluon exchanges at the same point times the vacuum splitting. Now, of course, we have a lot more possibilities than in the case of simple elastic scattering. We have a more complicated system with uh, two partons in the final state, and we have many more possible combinations of transverse momentum vectors that I mentioned. In addition to that, we have interference phases. Just like in the case of elastic scattering, we have the denominators of those uh, propagators, which will give contributions like omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. And when you square those, you know, you get specific combinations. If you wonder why do we have combinations, why have I written omega one minus omega two, omega one minus omega three? The reason is that uh, this is what will, uh, will appear in the final answer. The important part relative to the case of elastic scattering is that now we cannot neglect those interference phases in those plane waves 
And the reason is that now they come with those factors X times one minus X. Before I could make an argument that because P0 was is a very large number, you know, now I can consider them being approximately zero, but that's not true anymore. My X can be very small or my X can be very large. And then this certainly can be, uh, cannot, uh, you know, kind of the denominator is not necessarily uh, large. So we have to keep them. What those interference phases tell us is that, you know, the process of splitting, the process of parton splitting is not instantaneous, but it takes a certain time. It takes time inversely proportional uh, to those phases. And therefore, if you have something generated by virtuality here, simply in the hard part, this vacuum splitting, and something generated, for example, by scattering in the medium, those processes can interfere. And this is the essence of this landau branch breakdown effect. How do we calculate? These are the types of diagrams uh, which we calculate with single gluon exchanges. Now, in principle, you know, there can be contributions proportional to a Wilson line, uh, which I would not have time to talk about. The simple uh, thing to do is to take a light cone gauge, and then those contributions will disappear. So let's focus on the top three diagrams. And we have to do the longitudinal integrals for diagrams one, two, and three. Now, this is not to say you see that in the first uh, integral, I've simply shown one propagator. This is not to say that the diagrams have different dimension. They all have the same dimensions. Simply in this first diagram, this propagator doesn't have a Q dependence. So it's irrelevant in terms of taking the pole. When here are the types of uh, propagators that we have, the types of denominators and the types of poles that we are going to obtain. And by performing those integrals, just like we did them by counter integration, just like we did in the case of elastic scattering, these are the results that we obtain. And you see why now differences of those kinematic variables omega appear, they stay in the interference spaces. And that's why I defined them in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, slide. You can do the same calculation with uh, two gluon exchanges, two number gluon exchanges. And of course, you have to take the limit when those exchanges are at the same position. And finally, there are subtleties that whether you do this in the light cone gauge or in the covariant gauge, in the covariant gauge, you have to be careful and that Feynman rules for a transverse Wilson line that Ahmad and Gilbian collaborators also introduced. But when you do this in different gauges using you know, different ways, you always find the same result. And I've summarized this. If you do this in the RxC gauge, in the covariant gauge, you have to take care about this Wilson line that I said I didn't care about, but you don't have a transverse Wilson line. If you do it in the A plus gauge, you kill this, but there is no way to kill the transverse Wilson line. And this is because those are two orthogonal directions in our theory. They simply cannot be eliminated simultaneously. And we also found that because the sectors decouple, the Glauber loans do not talk to the collinear sector other than the vertex, you can do the calculation so-called hybrid gauge where for the collinear sector, you can choose you know, the, the light cone gauge for the exchange Glauber, you can choose an RC gauge and in all cases, the results are exactly the same. So it was somewhat satisfying, although it was technical and long exercise, it was satisfying to demonstrate that the in medium splitting functions that you will see quoted in the textbook are actually gauge invariant. Now, what are the properties? I've written, I believe in the textbook, we have all in medium splitting functions uh, to the so called first order in opacity. Here I show the example of a quark splitting to a quark in a gluon, and let's discuss some of its properties. First, you will see that it's uh, those splitting functions 
are proportional to the ones in the vacuum. That's why we derive the vacuum ones there. Second, you will see that they're dependent on the properties of the medium. So where do those properties hide? They hide in the scattering plants for gluons and quarks that are here in this line integral along the path of jet propagation. And they also hide in the range of the interactions in this normalized elastic scattering cross section that we talked about. You can model it by your power that we talked about in the case of scattering. Then we have contributions that are proportional to those transverse momentum propagators. Those are the cover sources in the medium. Each scattering becomes a source of radiation. And finally, we have those interference phases which hide the landau merange big effect. It tells us that, you know, kind of the formation time of those splitting processes has to be compared to the separation between the scattering centers. And another important property that you can see is we have one minus cosine, those interferences are destructive interferences. We get less radiation in the medium than we will legally get without the LPN effect. Finally, of course, if we don't have nuclear medium, if we simply have proton-proton collisions or electron-proton collisions, this is equivalent to saying that the scattering length is infinite and this whole contribution drops away and we reduce by going from a nucleus to a proton. We are back to our normal of the relativity splitting processes and radiation. Now, this just talks, it's, it's not very important, but we have to calculate those splitting functions. You saw that they're fairly, fairly complicated functions of the kinematic variables. They depend on the properties of the medium. So we have to have good, good models of the medium. When we have quark-gluon plasma, we model it by relativistic hydrodynamics. We distribute the production point of jets. That was the source J of P. We propagate those jets and we calculate the splitting functions. In case of nuclei, it's actually easier in cold nuclear matter. I mean, this is a dynamical medium. It expands, its temperature drops, the scattering lengths change. For the case of cold nuclear matter, it's much simpler. It's a static medium. There is still dependence on the density, but it's nowhere near as complicated as in the case of the future field. And so this, of course, is computationally intensive, but there are some tricks where you can speed it and you know, when I first wrote it, because I'm not very good at writing this, it took 18 days, let's say, to calculate one set of splitting functions. And now it takes an hour. And this is due to our you know, younger colleagues who have greatly improved this calculation. Let me show you some of the properties. <clears throat> Once you calculate them numerically, you can actually see how those in medium splitting functions look like. We do two-dimensional grids, both in terms of the longitudinal momentum fraction x and also the transverse momentum. And uh, you know, let's see how they look like. First, we integrate over both uh, kt and x within certain you know, kinematic range. And if that were in the soft balloon approximation, it would be interpretable as energy loss. Now, those are full splitting functions. They cannot be interpreted as energy loss. So, but this is just kind of an illustration of the strength of this integral and the relative contribution relative to vacuum splitting. Shown here are different orders of opacity, and the gray line is the average, which you know, kind of we think can be a good representation. For phenomenology, we still use like the blue dashed lines. Because even this demonstration, when you go to second order intensity, correlated scattering on two centers in the medium, it becomes very expensive. But the upshot of this is that because of the landau pomerange middau effect, which kills radiation, as you go to higher and higher carbon energies, this contribution diminishes. So at very high energies, we do not expect to have much of a medium contribution. The second thing that you see here is that when we go from light quarks to heavy quarks, and I only talked about light quarks 
but we can have charm quarks, we can have bottom quarks, you see that the contribution, at least at the smaller energies, is small. You see kind of this flatness relative to the steep rise. This is because heavy quarks cut out part of the phase space for radiation. This is true even in the vacuum, and it was told by Dachitzer about a million years ago, um, the dead column effect. So what you're seeing here is the dead column effect in the medium, the effect of the heavy quark mass. And this is something that the experimentalists and also theorists are very interested in. Now, let's go a little bit more differential. Let me not integrate over the momentum fraction x, but just integrate over the transverse momentum. And then you see how those uh, longitudinal distributions, the splitting function in x looks like here for light and heavy quarks and also you see the democratic branching blue one going to, to blue blue so far symmetric and the quark uh, a blue one going to QQ bar is symmetric whereas those are asymmetric but you know that they're, they're, they're supposed to be little mirror images of each other but they're of course finite edge of phase space effect where this is not exact the upshot of those distributions is that they're even softer than the ones in the vacuum. If you look at soft gluon radiation in the vacuum, it goes like one over X or one over on with the energy of the emitted gluon. And here, they, those are steeper. There are even more soft gluons than you produce in the vacuum. That's one very important property of in medium showers relative to the vacuum ones. Now, let me go even more differential select certain x and i believe we selected about 0 0.3 or something not very large not very small and plot the transverse momentum distributions and in order to make them visible i'm plotting the transverse momentum distributions in the from the medium that's the medium contribution relative to the vacuum one and so the blue line is the first order in opacity and that is the second order you know, this is the gray is the average, uh, which we think would probably be even better uh, for phenomenology than the blue one. But the upshot is that you see enhancement at intermediate transverse momenta relative to the vacuum. In other words, the second key property of those pattern showers is that they're broader than the ones in the vacuum. You may worry. Well, what you see here also in those fluctuations are those very detailed interferences that I talked about. Talked about. You may worry about that, you know, in some cases, some parts of phase space, there can be a slight negative contribution. But remember, what you're supposed to do is to take the vacuum radiation and then add the medium one. And as long as this does not go down to minus one, you know, there's no problem in adding those contributions together. So, if it's not on the slide, it won't be on okay. okay. All right, so let me take a sip of water. So that was about radiation. That's how we calculate in medium radiative interactions. Yes. I have a question regarding the previous slide. Should the distribution be zero? On the level of uh, no, unlike elastic scattering, when the corrections, you know, just kind of in transverse momentum would simply integrate to zero. In other words, elastic scattering simply redistributes, uh, you know, kind of changes the distribution of jets. These are genuinely new contributions to radiation that are on top of the vacuum, so they do not integrate to zero. That's a very good question. All right, so let's see what are the applications of those uh, in medium radiative corrections. So, of course, when, when you have radiative corrections, when you have branching and offshoreness here, in fact, you work in terms of KT, uh, you have evolution. And so uh, the medium will actually give a contribution to the evolution of various objects. 
And in this particular case, I'm interested in the evolution of the fragmentation functions in the final state. So the example that I give here is when we have nucleus nucleus collisions, we have a quarrel on plasma, and the jet propagates in the final state to the plasma, and that's where the radiative interactions come. So what do we have in the final state? We don't have the particle distribution functions. We have the fragmentation functions. So, so this is what is going to be changed by this medium-induced radiation. By adding those contributions to the vacuum ones and running the lab evolution, uh, we obtain the following predictions for the suppression of hadrons. Let me tell you once again what is shown in this figure. What is shown is the cross section in nucleus nucleus collisions properly normalized to the cross section in proton proton collisions. So, if there were no medium effects, this ratio would be one. But as you can see, this ratio is not one, it is suppressed by an enormous factor. It's suppressed by a factor of two. As I argued, you know, kind of the effects are largest when the energy of the jet is small. And as we go to higher energies, those effects become smaller. That was kind of the first numerical figure. As we go to higher energies, the extra effect is smaller. Uh, this is, in fact, a theoretical prediction before the data came out. And the SCT approach gives a better description or better prediction of the data than traditional energy loss approaches. Of course, the energy loss approaches themselves can be improved, but it is reassuring to see that something that required novel developments, such as in medium evolution, predicted the data quite well. So that's one example. And once again, you know, the suppressions are very large. One can even um, play a game. If you take the soft, the, the small x limit of uh, the in medium splitting functions, then all the off the diagonal, you know, those uh, second terms, all the off the diagonal contributions vanish. And making uh, simple models for the fragmentation function, you can, in fact, integrate analytically the Diglatt evolution equations and show that the modification of fragmentation functions is actually related to the energy loss. So there is a clear connection. What I'm trying to say is that. The in medium evolution approach gives better results, is more consistent with our understanding of QCD and high energy physics, but uh, it is not something that's completely disconnected from the traditional energy loss approach that has been successful for many years. And there is a clear connection between them. We just went a step further using effective field theory techniques. Yeah. This or the previous? <laughs> so we have to to hear. Uh, have we have to translate. Oh, we have to answer. <laughs> So that was your 30 minute warning. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, since I've moved now to the applications, I think we are on time. Go ahead. So, 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 so the blue curve, uh, and, and as, I, as I said, uh, you know, kind of, the, the, those are subtle differences. Uh, the evolution and the energy loss approach are connected, um, but the evolution. Is uh, approach is perhaps a bit more consistent. I don't know exactly how to describe the differences. Well, kind of the, the blue one is energy loss phenomenology. So, so it is particles go and lose a chunk of their energy, and maybe that was miscalculated or not calculated well. Or, you know, also that the, there are the parts of. Uh, full splitting functions, uh, which as you go, let's say from small x to large x, there's again enhancement and there are other contributions that may have been missed. While we're on this figure, um, maybe I missed it. So um, easy to understand why there is a bump at low PT and then 
another right. Like why is why are there two peaks in this? Oh, why are there two peaks? What's the low peak? So, so, so the low peak is uh, kind of uh, it's non perturbative physics. Uh, so, so this rise here, you know, there is of course some effect of multiple scattering, you know, this crowning effect, which here. <laughs> Which here would be double, which here would be double. But the essential reason is that uh, when you produce particles on the order of one to GeV nucleus nucleus collisions, uh, these are the bulk of the particles. That's where all of the energy will go. Uh, the scaling, the way in which this ratio is normalized, is assuming that the probes are rare and they carry very little of the collision energy. So in the denominator here is the number of binary collisions, which let's say this number, let, let's call it 2000 or something like that at the LHC. Um, and this is relevant as we go to moderate to high PT. But if you're going to produce uh, particles, soft particles, which carry the energy of the collision, uh, you don't have 2000 times the energy of the nucleon, you collide the nucleus that has 200 nucleons on a nucleus which has another 200 nucleons. So the most that you can get is uh, 400 times, so to speak, roughly the energy. So it's a totally different scaling. It is soft non perturbative physics where just this normalization one does not apply. And those normalizations are different. Instead of dividing by 2000 here, you have to divide maybe about 300, 350 there. So, so it's a little bit misleading that they're presented on this plot. And also, this is the reason for which I simply cannot extend this down because it doesn't make those calculations don't make sense in this very low region. We can also do this at the electron ion collider. So we can say, well, the effects there were large because we have a coronal plasma. So what will happen in cold nuclear matter? Many of you are interested in the future VIC. And uh, I have to point out that there have been measurements before, albeit at very small center of mass energies. Uh, those measurements were done at DASI. Uh, and the experiment is called Hermes. So it's a fixed target experiment. They put a nuclear target and shoot an electron beam of 27.6 GeV. And I'll, I'll let you calculate what all this is. It must be a future beam. But what they observe when they do the measurement, and this is a differential measurement, not simply as a function of uh, the hadron energy, but actually as a function of the fragmentation fraction Z. You see that even in cold nuclear matter at the, you know, relatively low center of mass energies, we have a significant and statistically, you know, clearly statistically very well measured suppression. It can be as large as a factor almost, you know, not a factor of two, but it can get quite close at large fragmentation fractions. So this is also an example where, for example, we describe the data with a Q-hat transport parameter of 0.05 Jeff square per Fermi for quarks, and we vary it up and down to get a generous you know, uncertainty band. So what are you going to get at the DIC? This is, if you do a measurement of a production of uh, partons as a function of the transverse momentum to the beam uh, for pi ions, d mesons, and d mesons, here is what you're going to see. Uh, if you focus at a relatively low center of mass energies, in order to see this type of physics, it is advantageous at DIC to do relatively low trans, uh, center of mass energies. The suppression of pions is quite spectacular. It's more than a factor of two. It's very, very significant. And even the suppression of D-mesons and D-mesons starts to become noticeable, but it is, of course, less. And the reason for which it is less is because of the shape of the fragmentation functions in DFD mesons. I'm simply showing you here the ratio of the medium evolved fragmentation function uh, for a large nucleus, like gold, divided by the evolution only in the vacuum. And you see that for pions, you get this suppression 
that kind is also seeing the measurement. But for D mesons and B mesons, there is transition from suppression to enhancement. And because this is uh, because this is of the specific shape of the fragmentation function, they have a bell shape. And you can think about you know shifting it and taking the ratio, and this is what you're going to get. So this yep, yeah. sure. Yes, and as I said, it comes fairly self consistent. You know, if you ask different groups, it's give this Q hat. Yes, the central green curve is the fit of this Q hat, which I quoted, but it's also consistent, for example, with the Cronin effect that I showed at the beginning. So, what we are trying to find is what is the average value of this parameter. What are the uncertainties that we can reduce? And then we can have one parameter description of this physics in nuclei, as opposed to trying to parameterize everything as a function of the atomic number, as a function of the impact parameter. All of this can be captured. Uh, no, they're not so huge, but we decided to be channels, right? You know, we don't know what's going to happen at the IC. So I want to, you know, kind of have a generous uncertainty band, and then see what this translates into. At the DRC. DRC is ten years away, so you know, I'm sure. Of course, we can. Of course, we're not going to get more data before DRC, but you know, there's room for theoretical improvement. So, second application: jet production. So, what I talked about here is hadron production. As a function of transverse momentum. Now let's go to jets. Now, for the purpose of hadron production, if you have a splitting, so to speak, it always affects the spectra. Uh, for jets, uh, this is not the case. And this is much more closely related to the transverse momentum component of this physics, the transverse momentum component of those pattern splittings. Uh, Tom talked a lot about jets, but the upshot is that to reconstruct the jet, we have to have an algorithm. I've illustrated it by a cone because that's the simplest way of doing it. And the jet is defined by the energy that your algorithm or your cone parameter captures. And what flows outside of the jet you know, does not go into your measurement, does not go your, to your cross section. If you remember, one of the main properties of the in-medium pattern showers is that they're actually broader than the vacuum. So imagine that I select a jet of a relatively small radius, then I will be missing a lot of my part on shower. If a significant part comes from there, it will affect my cross section. It will become smaller, right? Because I'll be missing the energy. So let's see how this works. So this is really very clearly related to transverse momentum physics. Let's look at jet production. Uh, Tom already talked about this. A uh, modern, uh, not, not unique, but certainly a modern way of describing jets is using the semi impulsive jet functions. The factorization formulas here given in deep elastic scattering are very similar to hadron production, but instead of the hadron taking the momentum fraction z from uh, the parton, it's the jet that calculate, uh, takes the momentum fraction z, and we have to calculate the jet function. It depends not only on the hard scale view, which we can select as PT, the transverse momentum of the jet, but it also depends on the jet scale, which tells us essentially how much space, transverse momentum space, space for radiation there is in the jet. We can improve the calculations when the radius is large, when the radius is one. Uh, you know, the same inclusive jet function. Uh, essentially would be identical to an next leading power calculation, let's say for a large radius jet. But if this uh, radius is small, then we have a hierarchy of scales between the jet scale and the hard scale, which we can resum, and it happens to be through the Glenn evolution equations. So we can improve predictions for small radius jets. What do we expect from jets in dense matter? Let's first start with you know the densest matter we know, the quantum plasma, 
And this technique, as I said, you know, we calculated splitting functions not only for light quarks and ones, we also calculated uh, for heavy quarks. This is an example of heavy quark jets at the LHC, in particular B jets. And if we calculate the contribution of the media uh, of the medium induced radiation to the jet function and get the cross section and then compare to proton proton collisions, here is what we happen if we do an analog calculation and leading log resonation. I have to point out that the leading log resonation is only to improve the proton proton cross section. We haven't done yet the resonations for the medium induced contribution there. So you have to be a little careful. The medium contribution is only analog. But you see that the suppression of uh, big quark jets is still very large, even to several hundred GeV. You know, we have a factor of two suppression of heavy quark jets uh, relative to the production in uh, proton proton collisions. And this is remarkable because now uh, this means that this broader in medium particle shower is very obvious. If it were leading hadrons, it's one thing, as I said, once there's a branching, it contributes to the evolution. But for jets, the radiation from the medium must have been outside of the jet cone to get this suppression. So it's very clear demonstration of the effect of on transverse momentum physics of uh, those uh, dense matter effects. Now, coming to uh, the contribution to the medium, in the medium induced contribution to the jet function. You know, to calculate the jet function to one group, now at three level, the jet function is simply the part of it. It always contributes, doesn't depend you know, on the reconstruction algorithm, on the jet down radius. The first non trivial dependence uh, happens when we go to one loop. And these are the diagrams that contribute to the jet function. Now, if we attach all possible interactions in the medium, you will quickly see that these are, in fact, the in medium splitting functions that contribute to the calculation of the jet function. And we can make this quantitative. And here are those diagrams expressed in terms of the in medium splitting functions and the corresponding kinematic cutoffs. We can add all of those diagrams, which contribute to one loop, and find an expression for the in medium contribution to the jet function. And it has to be understood as a distribution. It happens to be a plus function. And somewhere, I think, in the TMD book, uh, we've defined what the plus function means. That's how it has to be understood. Similarly, it can be calculated for gluon jets. That was just one specific example for quark jets. What are the effects? Now, at the electron ion collider, I already explained the physics. If we select a small jet count radius, we'll be missing a lot of the medium induced radiation. And uh, the cross section will be small. If we select a large jet count radius, the cross section will be large. In fact, final state effects and in medium radiation won't have any effect if we can capture all of it. Here are the results at the electron ion collider uh, at you know, the largest energy. In fact, it's not possible to run electron nucleus collisions at those largest center of mass energies. But we did this uh, just as an illustration. And you see a couple of effects. The green line is the effect of uh, you know, final state interactions in cold nuclear matter this time. And you see that there, you know, on the order of 10, 20 percent at low PT, but quickly disappear as we go to high PT, as I've mentioned many times. On the other hand, there can be initial state effects in nuclei, such as nuclear particle distribution functions. And we are probing large X in the nucleus. So there is an effect called an EMC effect, which is the reduction in particle densities. So this blue line is the reduction of particle densities. And then the red line is what we are going to observe when we do jet measurements at the AC, or if we could do them at those large energies, which we can. Uh, and also, this illustrates that uh, taking different parameterizations 
of nuclear power and distribution functions essentially gives us the same result within a few percent accuracy. But then the main question is, how do we separate those? Uh, one of the goals of the EIC is, of course, to constrain the nuclear parking distributions. A second goal is to constrain the transport properties of large nuclei, those final state effects and hadronization. So how are we going to disentangle those effects out of something that looks like that? And the idea is to take a double ratio, make a measurement of jet modification when the radius is large and when the radius is small and take the ratio. Why is that? Well, initial state effects such as nuclear pattern distributions are completely agnostic well, to first approximation about you know, the size of your final yep, depth. Sorry? Even beyond the first approximation, even at an all over, you get to the state acceleration. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like what. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, kind of, you, you get just kind of scales, uh, variations due to scale that they will even cancel in the single range as opposed to the double ratio. In the double ratio, I'm trying to, to cancel the initial state nuclear packing distribution effects. Now, the reason for which I kind of said that they'll approximately cancel, not absolutely exactly, is because if you vary the jet count radius, then you know you kind of capture different radiation for quarks and gluons, depending on the kinematic surface space. Gluon showers are broader than the quark showers. You can, you know, kind of, you can make tiny changes in how much quarks or gluons contributed from the initial state, but you know, kind of, the first approximation they will cancel, and I'll demonstrate that. Uh, when I choose a large jet radius, I will be capturing all of the final state medium-induced pattern shower, so it will have no effect. Okay. Uh, so I'll be canceling the initial state effects. I mean, that's also a little bit of an approximation. But if we do this hypothetical calculation um, at large center of mass energies and compare it to the previous slide, you will see now that for a small jet radius, you know, this red curve, or I'm sorry, maybe, maybe it was the blue, it kind of looks like the effect of final state radiation effects and this large EMC effect. The thing that, you know, went from slight enhancement to a suppression here is all gone. So that's what we were aiming to do. Eliminate the initial state effect and just look at final state in medium propagation and branching processes. And now if we go to the realistic, uh, this can actually be done. Those are 10 GeV electrons on 100 GeV uh, protons or nuclei. This can definitely be done at the IC. You see that when we go from a large jet radius to a small jet radius, we start to see very large suppression. And for the small radii, this suppression is well, it's not exactly a factor of two, but it's uh, pretty close to a factor of two. And this is what we saw in the quadrant plasma. And it's quite remarkable that in cold nuclear matter, we can get effects nearly as large as we can get in the quadrant plasma. So that's a promising way. To go after it. So that was jets. Now let me go to jets structure. And as Tom explained, now this is when <coughs> we start looking, we reconstruct the jet, but then we start looking inside it. And jet substructure is you know our modern way of saying you know what has been called many different observables that would be jet shapes, jet chart, jet fragmentation functions, etc. etc. Angularities inside jets. Uh, we all call them substructure. Now, the first thing that we did, and in fact, that was done before the formulation of SCTG. So it was not done with the full splitting functions. It was done in the energy loss approach. Uh, but uh, five years before the first measurement of jet was made in heavy ion collisions, uh, with uh, collaborators, we managed to predict not only that the cross section will be suppressed, by a factor of two to four, which is exactly what was measured. But we also managed to predict that the substructure will be changed. And uh, that substructure was the jet shape. So what is the jet shape? 
you know, we kind of uh, reconstruct the chart of certain radius, and then we start integrating the energy from the center to the periphery as a function of, you know, another small sub radius r. To start from zero, you know, and we don't have anything to integrate over. By the time you go to the full radius, your so do we have to do something about this? You know, your numerator and denominator are the same. The integral jet shape would be simply a monotonically growing function. But if we take a derivative with respect to R, then we will get the energy density inside jets. So it will be peaked toward the center of the jet, and then it will be falling toward the periphery. And so that's differential jet shape is a more sensitive observable to, to the changes in the jet substructure. And what is shown here was the first calculation about five years before this data became available in the energy loss approach. And it predicted that at intermediate values of this ratio, the small radius to the large radius, there will be a suppression and as we go to the periphery, there will be an enhancement. And this is simply because the difference in the shape of those transfers or radio distributions of medium induced radiation. You also see that because we used kind of a simple way to calculate uh, both the energy loss and the baseline uh, in problem, problem collisions, of course, the position of the minimum is you know, not well reproduced. But the relative suppression and the enhancement to our periphery, and this is the manifestation of the problem of the parking shower, are fairly well described. Yes? No, uh, this is just from the radiation. The broadening here is that you know there is a vacuum component. And there is a medium induced component, and it was not described using the full splitting functions. So it was simply the radio distribution of the energy loss relative to the position of the jet direction. So it was simple superposition without accounting that branching, of course, will change the direction of the jet. And so all of this affects how we describe you know, those minima. Uh, and you'll see the improvement in the next slide, but I just wanted to illustrate that those cross-section modifications and substructure are related. They were predicted, and that was what was measured many years later by the experiment. Now, if you do a better calculation, now this include, include the improvement in the calculation of the jet shape using soft collinear effective theory. And also we used full in medium branching and you can kind of see how you have to be careful, uh, you know, which of the particles falls inside the jet, outside of the jet, outside the subcon. Uh, these are simply, this is simply the partition of the phase space and how much of the energy, what is the weight, what you have to take inside. It can all be expressed once again in terms of those in medium splitting functions. And we can calculate the jet function, the medium contribution to the jet function, to the vacuum one, and then taking the ratio of those measurements in the vacuum and in the medium, here is what we can obtain. Uh, and there is a uh, noticeably, well, there is an improvement. You can argue that this minimum is still a little bit off, but there is a noticeable improvement in the description of the final state. And uh, you know, there are many effects that come into play. Uh, initial state effects, as I said, uh, pretty much do not affect what we see. Those are can be called nuclear matter energy loss, or nuclear particle distributions. They do not affect the final state observables. Uh, when we have suppression of jets, quark-initiated jets will be less suppressed than gluon-initiated jets. Remember this uh, Casimir ratio of 2.25 for gluons. The effects are about, you know, roughly speaking, 2.25 times larger. So if we simply take this contribution, we took into account that the jets are suppressed. We did not simply calculate the final state energy distribution. We'll be suppressing gluon jets, uh, gluon jets more, but gluon jets are 
broader than quark jets. So what we are going to get is slight narrowing. But if we put then include the fact that the medium in your shower is broader, so it trumps this effect, and actually you see the enhancement. So this is a very detailed calculation. There's a lot of physics, but the simple way to understand it is that we see this broadening of the medium time showers. This is the dominant effect. So that was something that was dominated by transverse momentum physics. So the last example that I'm going to give you is the longitudinal, you know, kind of the, the modification of the longitudinal splitting probability. I emphasized that splitting in the medium is also softer than splitting in the vacuum. And one really good observable that can prove this are the so-called groomed soft drop momentum sharing distributions. So, so what is that? It was introduced, you know, not so long ago, but it's kind of starting to push a decade. But the idea is that you reconstruct the jet and then you start looking inside the jet and you regroup the partons or particles that were inside into two leading subjects. Now, you construct a variable which takes, you know, kind of the minimum of the energy of those two jets divided by the sum, and you require that it's bigger than some minimum cut. Why do you require that? Because you want to probe hard branching and eliminate soft radiation and non-perturbative physics where you don't have very good control over. Now, I didn't draw here the incoming tartan, but uh, you, know, you can see for yourself that the first approximation, this is a direct measurement of the splitting functions, the outer is splitting functions. Now, of course, if you want to get a little bit more fan, and that's what's illustrated here. Of course, if you want to get more fancy, uh, you have to recognize that if those two subjects are very close, there can be linear divergences, and you have to do resummation. And here it's, it was simply done to, you know, leading plug, modified leading plug, pseudo of resummation. Uh, you don't have to do uh, splitting uh, resummation when the momentum fraction is small because you impose this cut. And so let's see what this will probe in the medium. So if we go to heavy ion collisions and do the same measurement, we are directly calculating the splitting in the medium to the splitting in the vacuum. And here is what the experimental data tells us. And here is what uh, the calculation is. And what both of them tells us, and this is confirmed by experimental data, we have enhancement of soft splittings and suppression of hard splittings relative to the ones in the vacuum. This is exactly what was predicted by this calculation of the in medium splitting functions that I talked maybe about an hour ago. And there are some things that are also very interesting. When we go to heavy quarks, we can even predict that if the momentum of the jets is small, this, the, this modification for heavy quarks will be even larger than the modification for light quarks. And that's something that is not yet measured. You know, this definitely is. This can be measured with upcoming experiments, uh, both at the electron ion collider, but also in heavy ion collisions by the SPINX experiment. And finally, this brings me to the summary. I hope we stayed on time. So what did we learn today? We learned that there are interesting forms of dense matter and uh, they can be recreated in hadron collisions, either with a single nucleus, in which case we have cold nuclear matter, or two nuclei, in which we can have hot nuclear matter like the protein plasma. We learned about transverse momentum browning. We can calculate it and we can describe all of those effects in terms of a couple universal parameters, like the transport parameter. So we can cut down two dimensions in our TMD parameterization. And if we know the TMDs, let's say on a proton, we can predict what they will be on nuclei at every single impact parameter. However, the effects are limited at low transverse momentum. So what happens uh, appears to be even more important are the radiative corrections from those in medium interactions. 
And uh, they generate pattern showers that are different from the ones in the vacuum. They are broader and softer, and their effect extends to much higher transverse momentum, much higher energies. If you go to infinite energies, as I showed you, this contribution will also disappear because of the landau branch middow effect, but it can extend you know, to hundreds of GV as opposed to just a few genes on the browning. And finally, I showed you phenomenological examples and applications where a lot of those observables, their modification was predicted long before the experiments took place. And they're confirmed in many cases with good quantitative agreement between the experiments and predictions. In some cases, of course, advances were needed relative to the simple energy loss approaches that I, I, I mentioned an example of the jet shapes, where there was a significant improvement in going to the full theory. So with this, uh, you know, thank you. And I'm ready for any additional questions. Thank you, Ivan. You win the prize for the most accurately timed talk. You finish two seconds before 531. We're open for questions. Oh, yeah, please speak uh, loudly. So, so here, when you say PC, that's the PC with the how long is the photon? This is the beam. Now, this PC here is relative to the beam direction. Okay, so, so it's like kind of hard to do something like what, what, what typical Q square or X. Oh, you can have what when you work in terms of PD uh, in the elastic scattering. Then you know you, you cover a range of Q square. So uh, you don't use Q square at your as your hard scale, you use your PT as your hard scale. In fact, that there can be processes without it or with quite low Q square that can be it. Okay, so this is also the hard stuff as well. Sorry? This this better also be cuts out of this way. So, so it depends on how you want to measure, right? So if you want to measure relative to the beam axis and you have PT, uh, then as I said, your Q square remains unconstrained. You can make it more constrained if you look at on Q square, but then it can become another constraint system. Uh, you can use Q square, for example, uh, but this is more suitable for inclusive PIS, right? When you want to measure x and q square. Here, q square is not constrained in those calculations, and it is not a hard scale. Yeah, I'm asking because the when you average say over a large range of q square and the uh, uh, x, uh, your x, you expect that your x is equal out of the magnitude chain as a function of the this is this is an interesting question. Uh, from the technology that I have done, and we have limited data, but as I said, we have data in uh, PA uh, for PA collisions and some limited data like occurrences. It is not possible to kind of constrain variations of Q square, right? Within the theoretical uncertainties. Uh, I don't know if uh, you know the average value of Q hat, this transfer parameter will change. Uh, I expect that if there's any change, it will be weak. As I said, we've not seen that. I mean, of course, one can go, uh, I'm aware of, uh, you know, attempts in the literature to use various measurements and just kind of fit it. And, you know, you take data, right, you make a model, and then you can get, you know, some dependence on this. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical. That's a very logical approach. It kind of tells us, give me data and I'll fit it. Maybe, maybe that's how it is, but I'd rather uh, be able to, with a simpler parameterization of uncertainties, predict as much of the data or you know, kind of see agreement with as much of the data. And then when I see variations, 
we have to think is it really the calculation going to improvement in the calculation or is it really that you have changed i mean that would be my my preferred approach Next question. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, this ratio shows very close result to 0 0.5. Can it be explained as geometrical factor, or is there some simple explanations for this stuff? <laughs> so it looks like the mm -hmm. right deviations from one mm -hmm. half, mm -hmm. it, like, uh, or is uh, indeed I effect I, I is I so huge? Means. I mean, from just looking on this plot and forgetting about anything, uh, it looks like the right deviation is from one half, but not from one. Basically, uh, the claim is that uh, doing calculations of red by alpha yeah, strong uh, squares, okay. so, I mean, you, 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 you but have. But that, that really is if you forget the parts, you know, and it looks like a half. But if you look at the most central position, say, the suppression is more than a half. And yeah, if you yeah, look at sure, the sure. peripheral positions, the suppression is less than a half. So, you know, kind of that is the nuclear, the medium sized dependence of this suppression. Um, but if you're asking me if that's something magical about the half, something that I commented about, that if we look at very soft particle production, there's a different scale. The answer is no. Okay. You know, there isn't a magical number it's that you somehow just expect. This calculation shows. Uh, just the calculations, the properties of the medium, you know, the type of jets, character of jets. And the other question is about formalism. So, mm -hmm. derivation is done with Glauber gluons. And then you also mentioned that one can do derivation with Coulomb gluons. As I understand, uh, EFT helps to simplify. And to go from Coulomb to Glauber, but in which cases we need still to keep exchange of Coulomb gluons with medium. In which cases do we need to keep exchanges? So, if uh, no kind of the picture of uh, technically, if you think that you can calculate perturbability, uh, first, this question is perhaps most relevant. If you think that you can calculate the interactions in the medium perturbability. I mean, the interaction is non perturbative, as I said, you know, kind of their directions. You put the parameters of this cloud of your exchange. So, uh, if you think that you have kind of propagation of energetic particles, you know, the, okay, the strip work moves one way, scatters in the particle, energetically moving from the different, you know, different direction. Or if the particle is bound in the nucleus, in other words, when you strike it, it's not a free particle that can. Freely recoil, massless particle, but somehow you know that is the binding to the nucleus. Then we have loud gluons. If the particle happens to be soft, like it's almost like in the vacuum, then it's possible, if those are soft fields, it's possible to have too long gluons. And again, this was the derivation. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, I and Ian did it, uh, we found this possibility. Uh, for Coulomb gluons also in the arms uh, when we were simply using soft fields, scaling the soft fields in the media. Um, but uh, I think for, for practical purposes, uh, for very and uh, for energetic jets, uh, probably the cloud is more good approximation. Mm -hmm. It becomes a phenomenological question that I cannot answer. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Seeing any questions on Zoom? Well, in order to have enough time for dinner, we should thank yeah. Ivan for his talk now. Great, so we'll see you in here at 7.45.